because he wants to desperately convince Beelzebub that their calculations were not totally wrong. Hello and welcome back to our classes on Paradise Lost Book 1. We have already completed the background and then started with the text itself. If you haven't watched the previous videos, the links will be given in the description box. You can always go and watch them. We plan to start today with the conversation that happened between Satan and Beelzebub after Satan came to consciousness in hell. So what we have seen earlier, we have seen that Milton opens his book by first giving an invocation and then by giving a description of hell where Satan fell. Now when we will look at the speeches, we will not be able to go through every line in detail which is not feasible. What we will do is we will take up important portions from these speeches so that we understand how Satan is presented in the epic all right so first we will begin with the first speech of satan which he addresses to his nearest mate or nearest friend beelzebub who was also rolling on that fiery lake in hell if thou beest he but oh how fallen how changed from him who in the happy realms of light clothed with transcendent brightness did thou shine myriads so bright so how is satan addressing beelzebub he is telling Beelzebub that Beelzebub has really changed a lot because of his fall. He was a very bright angel and now he has turned all smoky and dark. What Satan is focusing on is the fact that their transformation is a physical one. So instead of focusing on the spiritual aspect of their fall, he is focusing on the physical change that has happened to them okay and then he continues by saying that god is proven to be a superior force god has been able to defeat them because god had a weapon called thunder it is as if if god didn't have thunder then satan would have won so this is a very peculiar way of trying to justify his actions because let's suppose a politician he loses an election what is his first instinct the first instinct is to somehow establish before his supporters or before his party workers the fact that this was only a matter of chance like they could have easily won because now his first concern is to hold on to the supporters because the first instinct of the supporters is to question the leader here satan wants to think about which questions can come to the minds of his followers so he is saying that this was only lost because of thunder Till then who knew the force of those dire arms? Arms means weapons. So it is only because they did not know about the technology of thunder, therefore they were defeated. Now they know about thunder, so if in future they wage any war against God, they are better equipped because they know about thunder. Now this is a very warped logic which Satan is trying to establish here, but this is a desperate way in which he is trying to win back uh, if any affection is lost from his followers. Yet, not for those now what the potent victor in his rage can else inflict. So maybe the potent victor, the powerful winner can inflict upon us, can you know shower upon us even more punishment than what is already given to Satan and his peers. He is not at all going to repent or regret what he has done. So he's saying, yet not for those now what the potent victor in his rage, in his anger, can else inflict do I repent or change. 
Though changed in outward luster, so I have changed in my outward appearance, but from inside I have not changed. That fixed mind and high disdain from sense of injured merit, why was Satan so bent on taking on this war, of waging this war against God, because his merit was injured. He felt that somehow his greatness was challenged by God's decision not to choose Satan as his next in power. So he had this you know, ego hurt when God had made that decision and that sense of injured merit will sustain him even after his fall. So the transformation which Satan is focusing on is a transformation of the body. Although we know that spirits are uh, considered to be without bodies, but he is concentrating on the outward changes that have happened to them. And then what does he say? His utmost power with adverse power opposed in dubious battle on the plains of heaven. So the battle which Satan waged against uh, God, that battle is referred to as a dubious battle. Dubious means something which is doubtful, where you do not have any guarantee that one side is going to win. For example, if there is a cricket match between say India and England, uh, you are not certain which side uh, might win because on one day India might win, another day England might win. So they are fighting on a dubious level, doubtful level because you don't know which side is certain to win. There is a kind of almost an equal chance of one side winning over the other. But in case of a cricket match between say India and um, Kenya or Netherlands, you can safely assume that it is definitely not a dubious match. You are almost certain that India is going to win. No disrespect to the other nations which I mentioned, it's just that they don't have that kind of cricketing expertise that India has right now. So while Satan is calling this battle a dubious one, what he's actually doing is he is in the mind of his uh, listener, in the mind of Beelzebub, he is trying to put in the thought that we are almost equal. So by calling it a dubious battle, Satan is equating his power with God. It is as if he could have easily won the war if that thunder was not there. So this is how Satan is glorifying himself. Then come those immortal lines and the lines for which Satan is remembered, Milton is remembered down the ages. Okay, what are the lines? What though the field be lost, all is not lost. The unconquerable will and study of revenge, immortal hate and courage never to submit or yield and what is else not to be overcome. So what though the field be lost? The field, that battle, that one moment of loss is not everything. Satan says that if he has the unconquerable will, if his will power, if his desire to win is still there in him, then he is not you know, actually defeated. When you defeat an enemy, you need to defeat his soul. Satan's soul is undefeated according to Satan. And what are the things which he glories in having? The unconquerable will, the desire to take revenge, the desire to gain back the power which he has lost in even more. And study of revenge, immortal hate. So his weapons are see hatred, revenge and courage never to submit or yield. Now when you look at the Christian doctrine, the most valued virtue is submission to God, is repentance. You know about the concept of confessions. Why are people asked to confess their sins? Because when you confess, first you acknowledge your guilt, second you surrender to the 
will of God. That I am placing before you the fact that I have done these things and I am sorry for them, that is confession. So a person who decides to confess is a person who is trying to change from a guilty one to a non-guilty person. But Satan from the very beginning is banking on his virtue, what he calls the virtue of fixity, the virtue of remaining adamant in his position. He is not going to repent at all. That glory never shall his wrath or might extort from me. So God's anger, God's power, his wrath, his might will not take away, will not extort away from Satan these qualities. So he does not submit, he does not surrender. Although he is totally vanquished, totally defeated. To bow and sue for grace? I mean, you are expecting me to beg for mercy, to appeal to God with suppliant knee, with bent knee. That is how a person goes to a church and prays before God. So Satan does not want to do that and deify his power. So he is not ready to deify God's power. Deify means to call somebody a God. So he is not ready to call God, God. To deify his power who from the terror of this arm. So he is now referring to his strength that God had feared that Satan would win. So this is all his assumptions and why is he assuming these things? Because he wants to desperately convince Beelzebub that their calculations were not totally wrong, that Satan had a chance. So when you take away that feeling that you have a chance, then you have no power left to take revenge. So that is why it is important for him to convince Beelzebub that they had legitimate reason to go against God because they were actually as powerful as God. Who from the terror of this arm so late doubted his empire? So Satan is trying to claim that God had doubted his strength, God's strength because of Satan's power that were low indeed. So bowing and suing for grace is low indeed. So this is how Milton writes. Milton will give you uh, a series of clauses. So you will have to keep your focus straight on the main subject of the sentence. To bow and sue for grace, that will low indeed. In between you have a series of phrases and clauses. Okay, so this, this style we have seen even from the invocation itself. That were an ignominy and shame beneath this downfall. So I have been defeated, I have been thrown down to hell. This is a downfall. But if I surrender, that will be even a greater downfall. So he now is actually talking about a spiritual defeat which he is not ready to accept. And then what does he decide? He is trying to hold on to the hope that by direct warfare or by guile he is going to take revenge. So from the first speech of Satan we have the statement from Satan that he is very powerful, that their battle was not illogical, that their defeat is only a pattern of chance and simply because God had a better weapon. The point of this first speech is not to establish Satan as a heroic character. Let me be very straight about this. If you look at these lines, you know, all is not lost. You might feel that this is very heroic. It's like the Renaissance man is speaking. That man is the center of the universe. If his soul is undefeated, he is undefeated. It's very heroic. But what is heroic in a non-Christian way of thinking may not be heroic in the perspective of a Puritan Christian. So heroism is a matter of perspectives. And I want you to ponder on one thing that when we judge a person by the words he speaks, are we always right in our assessment? Or should we look at what the person does? If you depend on Satan's speech only, for assessment of Satan, then we will be making a big mistake. The heroism which you see in his speeches is the heroism he wants to project. Now if we are to believe in every word that a person speaks, then politicians would be the most heroic people in this world, the most virtuous people in this world. I'm not calling them vicious, but we don't trust them, do we? 
similarly do not place all your faith on the words that satan utters is he speaking to himself it is not even a monologue so if he is not speaking to himself obviously at the back of his mind an urgent need is operating the need to convince his people just like a defeated politician does that might sound very uplifting very taken out of context these words can enliven any defeated person but is it very encouraging is it very heroic when you actually look at the words guile you look at the word hatred okay immortal hate so if these are the driving forces of any person how far do we call him a hero so i will put that question to you write down in the comment section what you really think about it so we will go on to bilzebub's reply bilzebub is asking very legitimate questions i will just have a glimpse through the questions he is asking him that what if god has decided to punish us even further what is the purpose which we are going to serve here in hell he is talking about two purposes one is if they are in hell that will give god some satisfaction that he has defeated the rebel angels and they are in hell is that our purpose or are we supposed to run errands for god god is going to order us to do things and we are going to just simply follow his orders in hell what is our next step going to be to that satan immediately responds by saying that we will definitely not do what god is going to ask us to do so you see satan is disturbed by the questions which bilzebub has because those questions contain in them some elements of doubt about their future course of action and satan understands that it is very important to provide his followers with a clear direction that this is going to be our course of action and what does he say in his second speech which is also very remarkable fallen cherub to be weak is miserable doing or suffering but of this be sure so he is giving him a clear directive to do ought good never will be our task so no matter what we do we will always try to undo any goodness that god shows as being the contrary to his high will we will always be the opposite of god that is going to be the purpose of our existence whom we resist if then his providence out of our evil seek to bring forth good now these lines are very important because uh, what is the purpose of evil why does god need evil to be there god needs evil because whenever evil corrupts man and man falls then god can come and save him so it's like like good cop bad cop kind of a situation where you need the evil in the world so that the good looks better that's very selfish of good rather i would say but that is again a, an open question so the point is satan is trying to say that if god has decided to appear more good because we are bad then we will make him look even worse so our job will be to continuously oppose god so he's very clear about it coming down a few lines here satan is talking about his surroundings and he sees that the hailstorm has stopped and uh, he decides to explore the area more so he asks bilzebub that it would be better if they got up from that lake of fire and approached the land seest thou yon dreary plain forlorn and wild so up till now we were looking at hell as a place of liquid fire now he is describing the land of hell which is again a solid fire but it is equally forlorn and sad and full of suffering it's no respite it's no rest but at least it will give them some convenience because floating on that lake of fire is not a very convenient situation for anyone 
So Satan decides to lift himself up from that pool of fire and approach the land of hell. Now we come to a very important aspect of Paradise Lost, which is also a very important convention of epics, the convention of epic similes. Just after Satan stops speaking, he lifts himself up and goes and reaches the land of hell. Before that, Milton describes Satan. Now up till now, we were looking at Satan through his words. Now we will look at Satan from an outsider's point of view. And who is describing Satan? Milton, which means the heavenly muse is telling us details or giving us details about the size, the stature of Satan and what uh, is the description like? Thus Satan talking to his nearest mate with head uplift above the wave and eyes that sparkling blazed, his other parts besides prone on the flood. So his head is uplifted, his eyes are sparkling and his rest of the body is almost paralyzed on the pool. Extended long and large lay floating many a rood. So his body was huge. The body which was floating in a paralytic way, it was like, it was miles and miles long, many a root. In bulk, as huge as whom the fables name of monstrous size. Now, Milton is giving us some names. Names of gigantic creatures, gigantic deities, demigods, who are mentioned in the classical fables. What kind of deities? Titanian or earthborn that ward on Jove. So Satan's bulk, Satan's size is as huge as the Titans. And then Milton is qualifying Titans as earthborn because Titans were children of earth and Jupiter. And what they did because they were not fully divine, because their mother was earth, they were considered to be second great citizens and not heavenly enough. They declared war against their father, Jupiter, who is also Jove. Therefore, what Milton is doing is he is comparing the size of Satan to the size of the Titans. And at the same time, there is a parallel comparison between the rebelliousness of titans with the rebelliousness of satan and the fact that they share a kind of empathy of sin that satan is a sinner in rebelling against his father figure just like the titans wrongfully rebelled against jupiter so this is epic simile where the simile simile is anywhere you uh, where you compare one thing to another this goes beyond just one level of comparison you have multiple levels of comparison and this becomes an important tool in the hand of milton because he is also trying to expand the horizon he is trying to take you away from the main storyline and think about titans, their war, their problems. So this is what Epic Simile does. It offers a primary line of comparison, then it gives you a secondary line of comparison, something which is more subtle, through which character of Satan is revealed here. And third is it widens the horizon in front of your eyes. It makes the epic really epical. Then he mentions few others like Briarus, Typhon. The most important epic simile in this part is the epic simile of Leviathan. Leviathan was uh, an imaginary sea beast. Leviathan is not in itself a vicious creature. It's like a whale. But let us look at how Milton is describing Leviathan. Or that sea beast Leviathan, so Leviathan's size, which is a huge size, is compared to the size of Satan. So that is the primary line of comparison, comparison of size. And then he says, which God of all his works created hugest that swim the ocean stream, him happily slumbering on the Norway foam, happily doesn't mean happily, happily means happens to, 
he happens to swim leviathan is swimming on the norwegian uh, part of the ocean the pilot of some night founded skiff deeming some island now a skiff is a small boat so a fisherman or a seaman on a small boat he thinks that the leviathan is an island and what does he do because it's a norwegian sea it's very cold out there and during the night he doesn't want to go missing somehow lost <clears throat> so what he does he anchors places his anchor and decides to spend the night on that island uh, what he thinks to be an island which is actually leviathan's body oft as seamen tell with fixed anchor in his scaly rind moors by his side under the lee now what is a lee in any hill you have two sides one side which faces the wind that is the windward side and lee is the opposite side which is a shade away from the wind direct wind so if the leviathan's body is on the water and the wind is blowing from one side the sailor decides to anchor his boat on the opposite side so that he doesn't feel the cold and he stays there and the night is slowly approaching the dawn and then milton says while night invests the sea and wished morn delays so the morning which he is wishing for is not coming so what is happening here it's a very simple scene that is placing before us okay what is it to do with satan he could have just said that he is as huge as leviathan why does he give you this story now this is where again the epic simile is starting to work you see leviathan size is huge satan size is huge that comparison is an easy one leviathan is not deliberately sinful it is not attacking the pilot right it is not devouring the pilot maybe it's not even noticing the pilot because so huge that that boat is so small compared to leviathan size but what is happening here is that the leviathan is deceiving the sailor consciously unconsciously doesn't matter the sailor feels safe anchored on that island but his feeling of safety is not at all a stable one any time the leviathan can take a dive and drown that seaman with him so this is what leviathan is similarly if a man chooses to place his trust on satan then he would drown just like that seaman so the epic simile is expanding your horizon you are now thinking about that seascape you are thinking about that imaginary leviathan you are thinking about that that sad fate of that seaman there so you are thinking about so many things now your mind is widened so this is what the epic simile will do to you on the first level primary level it will compare the size of satan with leviathan then it will make you feel that element of deceptiveness deception as an integral feature of satan's character which you will find in the story given with the description of leviathan okay so here we have so many epic similes uh, going on after which milton says that so stretched out huge in length the arch fiend lay chained on the burning lake so satan was chained down this much this much we know so if he was chained down how could he go up to that land nor ever thence had risen or heaved his head but that the will and high permission of all ruling heaven left him at large to his own dark designs it was god who set him free why did god set satan free that's again an interesting thing that with reiterated crimes repeated crimes so that with repeated crimes he might heap on himself damnation that he could be you know damned further he could be punished further while he sought evil to others 
Because God knows that Satan is going to act like Satan. So more he acts like Satan, more he becomes satanic, the more reasons God will have to show justice to the people whom Satan is going to corrupt. So it's a part of God's design. Evil is part of God's design, isn't it? So God's grace which allowed Satan his freedom, which also shows that God believes in giving choices. He knows what choices they are going to make, but it is a kind of a pretense of a choice, a facade of a choice. It's not probably a very, very 50-50 kind of a choice which he is giving. No Satan will be choosing the path of the Satan. Okay, not repent. But it looks like God is giving him a choice here. Let's see what you do. He raises up his wings all flapping up. He reaches that land and then that land is described in another set of epic similes. What is that here? If it were land that ever burned with solid as the lake with liquid fire and such appeared in hue. So the lake was liquid fire and this land is solid fire. You can imagine a uh, land which is solid fire if you think about the volcanoes uh, where the lava flows out and this whole place becomes solidified with heat. And such appeared in hue, in color, as when the force of subterranean wind, wind which is underground. So suppose there is an underground wind which you know, kind of tears away a part of a volcano, transports a hill torn from Pelorus or the shattered side of thundering Etna. Pelorus, Etna, these are all active volcanoes that is mentioning here. So a part of those active volcanoes, if you take them out and place somewhere, it will be the land of hell. Okay whose combustible and fueled entrails, entrails means insides, okay, usually entrails refer to the intestines and um, inner organs of humans. So here entrails means the minerals which are there inside the volcano because volcanoes are very mineral rich uh, mountains. Thence conceiving fire, sublime with mineral fury, aid the winds and, ha and leave a singed bottom, all involved with stench and smoke. So again, the comparison is with the heated surface of a volcano and the heated surface of hell's land. But the secondary meaning emerges when Milton is describing the whole scene of a volcano, that a volcano, it might have a lot of mineral content in it, a lot of value in it, but it can only bring disaster for human civilization. You also have these religious associations of volcanoes with destructive forces. Therefore, comparing the surface of hell with a volcanic surface, is not very unusual. It is very expected. Such resting found the soul of unblessed feet. A beautiful play of words here. Soul of unblessed feet. Now literally S-O-L-E means the part of your feet. But when you listen to that word and remember Milton was dictating. So I don't know. Maybe it was he said soul. S-O-U-L. Or maybe not. But it is very similar or it is similar sounding to the word S-O-U-L. So because Satan doesn't have a body, he only has his spirit, all right, because he's an immortal spirit. Therefore, these expression, soul of unblessed feet, is very significant. So this is the resting, this is the prison house which is offered to him. Him followed his next mate, both glorying to have escaped the Stygian flood as gods and by their own recovered strength. They thought that they could escape that lake because they had recovered their strength. But we know the real reason that God had permitted them to do so. And then Satan speaks about his frustration and his eventual resolve. So we will take up this later 
conversations in our future class. Till then, I would advise you to go through the text in detail and ask me any questions about any phrase or any meanings which you want me to explain. I will be happy to help you out in the comment section itself and we will have a detailed discussion on Satan's character and his representation in a dedicated video. But here in our textual reading, I will try to focus on things which are important for you to understand more about Satan and how Milton wants us to look at Satan. So I hope to see you very soon again and we will continue with the text and detailed reading. I hope you all stay very happy till then. Meet you all very soon. Bye.